doing this one now. Hello everyone and welcome to Let's Play Metroid Prime Remastered. I've been meaning to get to the Prime games uh, for at least a couple of years now, but I always held off on it because I wanted to do the GameCube release rather than the Wii releases through Trilogy, just to show them off in their original forms, maybe do one sequence break here or there, but with Prime Remastered shadow dropping about uh, a month and a month and a half ago now at the time of recording, and after streaming a playthrough of this over on Twitch just to re-experience the game again, I realized this is just the best version of this game to do now between its visual upgrades and especially the control style upgrade. Because even as someone who likes the original controls, the new stuff is just better. So we're going to be starting a fresh new game on normal mode because casual mode I think isn't the right balance and hard mode that would give me benefits by getting the rest of the gallery stuff, but I'd just rather not. And here we have the only real loading time in the game. You get this every time you load your save file up. Uh, not that the original Metroid Prime took a long time to load to begin with, though. Not that I can think of many GameCube games with absurdly long load times, now that I think about it. Anything I can think of was because of a PS2 port or something like that. Unidentified Distress Beacon has been tracked to a derelict space vessel in orbit above Talon 4. Welcome to the friggin' Orphean in Metroid's first first-person shooter. Again. So, starting off, we have a couple things we can do. We can press the A button to fire our weapon, we can charge it as well. Uh, but what I just did there is something you gotta be doing a lot. You wanna press right on the D-pad to access the scan visor. This allows you to scan computers, activate puzzles, figure out lore from certain other documents. That's probably gonna be the mode you're in the most outside of your main combat visor here. Uh, Button-wise, X, I believe, is the native uh, morph ball button, and Y is the native missile button. I might have that backwards, because I think I may have switched that control early on on my first playthrough and just kept it that way. For example, there's some lore. Entrance to exterior docking hangar. Some of the lore is just very techno babbly, but there's a lot of stuff that actually will tell you more about what's going on around you in the game. It's the main way the game actually tells its story, now that I think about it, because there's not a lot of, like, big cutscenes in the game. By and large, everything we see this part is just tutorial to get you used to the game's movement. That was more useful, admittedly, in the GameCube version, because the GameCube's controls for this game were... interesting. Morphology unknown. Info. High levels of radiation detected. That's not the best. 
This is our first creature entry into the logbook. Morphology Parasite, Interstellar Vermin. They travel in swarms. Indigenous to Talon 4, a single parasite is harmless to a larger life form. However, they tend to travel in large groups, often swarming over potential prey. Such swarms are dangerous. Morphology Space Pirate. Status, death caused by severing a spinal cord. Yeah, that'll do it. The logbook is one of the two metrics of completion in the game. Every new monster you encounter, every new lore you find, uh, even item pickups can be scanned to give you stuff towards your logbook. We're getting all the scans in this game. Not that there's a lot that are missable, uh, but I am going to note the missable ones when we find it. Hold the attack button to use your charge beam. It can be used to destroy rubble, but it's more often just a better attack. Kind of annoying though, and we'll see this as we progress through. Uh, they made it so that you automatically fire three shots before charging and remastered, and I don't get why. Right, here's something interesting. Here is our first map station. Walk into a map station hologram to download a map for the area you're currently in. I'm not going to be quite over every cutscene like that, by the way. I just want to get the atmosphere in there. So the map in this game is full three-dimensional. You get a good idea of what rooms are shaped like. Uh, this does lead to some problems with item completion, I find, here and there. And on top of that, it's sometimes hard to tell if you're looking at the map from the top or bottom. But the map system in this game is overall pretty good. I like that, like, in the main Metroid games, you have a good preview of it on the top right of the screen. And that can easily tell you where doors are in relation to you, at the least. So, I bring up the GameCube controls. On the GameCube, this game is sort of controlled like Goldeneye, weirdly. Where your analog stick was for moving forward and backward, and left and right were for rotating. It was basically tank controls. If you wanted to look around, you had to hold the R button and then move the analog stick. The C stick was used for something else entirely on the GameCube. And if you prefer that control method, you do still have access to it. This game has a litany of control options, ranging from the modern two-stick controller for first-person shooters, the version of the original uh, GameCube controllers. I think you can even use the GameCube controller for the Switch on this game. And uh, there's even a version that mimics the Wii Trilogy's controls if you want to use the pointer. And if memory serves, there's also a fourth control scheme that kind of, like, combines two of them, but I forget which two it combines because I I tried it out on the stream if memory serves, and I was just like, nope, this, this bounces off completely. The, I find the modern control scheme that just brings the standard first-person controls uh, set into it just to be the most comfortable now. Not that the original game's controls are uncomfortable for the GameCube controller, it's just, it's weird to go back to. With that said, because this is a 100% logbook thing, you're gonna see me taking a moment to scan every new monster we come across, just so I mark them off as early as I can. Here we got auto turrets, they're easily destroyed with missiles, which you fire with the R button. Morph Ball, by the way, is the fastest way to move in the game, uh, even though I haven't used it in about a minute. But in here we have our first of a unique different type of scan. Red scan blocks. These are usually lores or important for puzzles. Log 09.992.3. Zebus has fallen. All ground personnel are presumed dead. Either killed by the hunter clad in metal, or in the subsequent destruction of the underground facilities. Our research frigates Orphean, Soriacus, and Volparagon were in orbit at zero hour and managed to retreat. Frigate Orphean is now docked at Vortex Outpost. Orphean's cargo appears to have a 100% survival rate. Metroids are healthy, but on restricted feeding schedules due to uncertain supply status. We are ready to begin research on the Metroids and other promising life forms. Security status remains at code blue. No signs of pursuit from the hunter. Great, so Metroids escaped Zabis. Perfect. And that does actually kind of highlight where this game takes place. Prime are some of... Our, the Prime Trilogy are some of Samus's earlier adventures. Uh, I believe they take place between Metroid 1 and 2 in specific. And for a while, were duplicitly canon. Uh, I think due to some statement that people either misunderstood or some weird wording from, I want to say it was Sakamoto, uh, during the press cycles for Other M in particular, I think? And there's still some contention about it in the fandom to this day. I prefer to say they're canon if only because... It makes some things funnier and sillier in retrospect, uh, particularly uh, some parts of Fusion, I find. But it's also just because we get to see Samus be a complete kit badass in these games. So, the lores. Uh, that one we just read there, and that computer in the last room or two. Uh, that is a missable scan if you're looking for them all, so be careful to make sure to grab that. And they're gonna be, by and large, the only scans I read except for boss fight scans. 
as they're the way that story is told, so I figured it's important we at least read those. By the way, every space pirate in here technically doesn't count for a space pirate scan log because they're already grievously injured, so I guess it doesn't count as the same species for some reason. This door opens with the Morph Ball. These are the main two types of puzzles in the game, Morph Ball and Scan Visor. So you can see me doing it a little bit here, but something I recommend you take advantage of as soon as you can is what's known as Rapid Fire Missiles, because when you fire a missile normally in this game, there's a notable cooldown on it before you can fire again. But in Prime 1 in specific, and they kept it in the remake, uh, there is an animation oversight that they kept in, where if you fire your power beam at a certain rhythm while tapping the missile fire button, you can fire missiles at a rate much closer to that of the 2D games, and it makes bosses and enemies a complete non-issue, even though we have very limited missiles for the moment still. Door lock enabled. Alright, let's see what's behind mystery door number two. Call it a hunch, I have a feeling it might be a Smash Brothers stage. I, I don't know what's making me say that, though. boss fight in the game is against the Parasite Queen. Let's see what the scan log has to say about her overall. Parasite female, genetically enhanced by unknown means. A weak spot has been detected in this creature's mouth. Use your auto-targeting to acquire this new target. Scans indicate the presence of a potent mutagen, origins unknown. The creature exhibits the ability to fire weapon-grade blasts of energy from its mouth, a trait not present in the standard Parasite genome. It appears the pirates have begun a bioengineering program with considerable results. So they bring up auto-targeting there, that's something your missiles do in this game. They actually have a bit of a homing property to your main target. And as you can see, the rapid-fire missiles that I'm trying to do here can just waste this thing's HP. It fires laser blasts at you, when you do enough damage, the shield around it rotates a bit, and you can only really damage it for a little bit with the power beam. Uh, this fight is considerably easy, though. Reactor core critical, evacuate immediately. Ah, the good old Metroid self-destruct sequence. There are no new scans you can get along the way here, by the way, unless you missed, like, the auto turret on the way in or some parasites here and there. You can just run without having to worry about scanning stuff unless you want to just see the extra lore, because when you're on the scan screen, timers like this do pause. In the rare case, they actually show up. You can even turn off some auto turrets like that, which I find kind of funny, but you can still blow them up in the case you can see them. This game might start off with a self-destruct sequence, just like Super Metroid, but this is a very generous timer. I usually end with two to three minutes remaining, usually. You do have to go relatively out of the way, but it's not that hard. And even then, if in case you do die, you're not going to be sent back too much, as long as you use that save point that I scanned right before the Parasite Queen. This section of the game definitely used to intimidate me as a kid. In fact, I'll get into this as we go through the entire game. There are several points in this game that actually scared me as a kid, but... It uh, it's mostly just because I wasn't used to this kind of stress yet uh, in games, whereas nowadays it's really nothing. I think the most recent time I've played a game that has a time limit that scared me was a boss fight uh, in the latter half of Trails to Azur for reasons. If you're wanting to go really fast, then whenever you're in a downhill area like this, switch to your Morph Ball because you do actively roll down upwards faster than you can walk. Even though Samus' walking speed in this game isn't really anything to laugh at. Uh, the game does good about making rooms a good scale on top of that, too, so you can move through the level design relatively quickly in this. I guess I might as well get into this on the self-destruct sequence, too. Uh, I brought up being scared by this game as a kid. I did play this as a real youngin', but uh, it wasn't at launch. This game launched the same day as Metroid Fusion back in 2002. Uh, I didn't play it until at least 2004 or 5, I think? My mom saw the teen rating, probably, and uh, just wouldn't pick it up for me for a few extra years because I was pretty easily scared, and admittedly, this game does get kind of intense on that level in some parts, but overall, it's it's a relatively light teen rating. I think it's just animated blood and violence, 
and most of that violence is just because you're probably aiming an arm cannon at things directly. This game doesn't get much more visually intense than, say, Metroid Fusion or Zero Mission, and I think those are both rated E from memory. Fusion might not have been. Let me actually check that. Metroid Fusion ESRB. I think that'll be just on their website. Yeah, that's rated E, so it, it's about the same level. Love that look from Samus right there. It's like, oh god damn it, he's back again, cause uh boy Ridley. Also, that was our grapple beam tutorial. You hold the lock on button at grapple points and you swing across. Not that we're gonna be doing that again for a long while, but at least it's there, I guess. There's a couple points in this tutorial I go, they're teaching you this stuff way too early compared to when we're actually gonna be able to use it reliably, and that's probably the most obvious version of that. <laughs> We just lost our shit. Various suit malfunction, morph ball malfunction, missile malfunction, charge beam malfunction, and grapple beam malfunction. We are back to base power suit sandwich with just a piddly power beam. Not that it matters a lot, if anything, uh, even with just our power beam, this is easily one of the most capable early game Samuses just because of how the combat works in Prime. It's like this and... Uh, other M are arguably where she starts at her strongest, which I find kind of funny. Tracking on enemy target has been lost. Ground-based recon required. Begin landing sequence. Welcome to the surface of Talon 4. We're spending the rest of the game here going through basically just a 3D Metroid environment that kind of comes down to being almost a gigantic Zelda dungeon. And something I recommend doing, I don't do it for a while, I'm not going to say when, uh, scan your gunship because it is a research scan. I forget to do that for a while, so let's just move on, I guess. There's a couple of other doors in this room, but we can't really go too far in any of those directions to matter right now. Instead, we're gonna come over here and face these beetles! You can just blow them up by mashing your, uh, power beam. In fact, if there's anything I can say, I mentioned about ten minutes ago, probably, that I don't like that the charge beam can only be fired after firing three shots in Remastered. It works for smaller enemies if you just mash the button, though, because that means you're firing three shots just super quickly. Don't shoot the sap sacks, by the way, because they do explode, and while that can kill enemies, it can also damage you. By and large, the logbook for enemies gives some nice, like, background detail, and might even tell you some things about the enemies' inner workings, like we can only kill gamers uh, if we have more concussive abilities. 
most enemies in this game do come down to being killed by your weapon or your missiles. There's not many ways you can actively defeat enemies. But this is interesting. The access to Chozo Ruin West has been granted. Elevators are how you get between areas in this, just like in the main series. And I'm also going to use them frequently to end parts. With that, I'm going to need to end this off here. Thank you guys for watching, and in part two, we're going to go access the Chozo Ruins. See you guys, then.